Good evening and welcome to this Cumberland Conversation with Leroy Logan. And Leroy, thank you so much for being with us. If this is your first experience of a Cumberland Conversation, just to say it's an informal discussion where we explore issues through the life and work of a guest speaker. Leroy and I will have a conversation for about 30 minutes or so, and then we'll move to Q&A and we'll finish promptly at seven o'clock. If you've got a question for Leroy and you're watching live on Zoom, you can submit a question using the Q&A function. And you can also comment on our Facebook live stream and we'll be live tweeting using the hashtag CL Conversations. Just to set the scene, uh, for many years, Cumberland Lodge has worked with the police to run an annual conference on issues about policing and society. And that's how Leroy and I first met as part of the work we did recently on understanding and policing gangs. Well, little did uh, I know that uh, Leroy would soon be the topic and subject of a high profile BBC uh, biopic. And Leroy, just to kick off, could you just tell us um, about about this 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 film, Red, White, and Blue, and uh, how how it came about, and uh, and what's it about? Well, how it came about was as far back as 2015. I was uh, approached by a, a journalist who's a freelance journalist, and her name is Helen Bart, a uh, very good friend of mine. And she said, I'm going, I'm going to record your story because someone quite prominent wants to hear various stories of police officers uh, from a Caribbean background or West Indian background during the 60s, 70s and 80s. That's the scope of the time frame. So I said, fine. Uh, I did that sort of late 2015. And about mid 2016, I find out that it's Steve McQueen and he's chosen my story, which I thought, and that was just after him um, getting the Oscar for 12 Years a Slave. So I, I was absolutely uh, gobsmacked, as they say. And I um, sort of met him uh, later that year in 2016. And we got on really well uh, because he's from London as well, of Caribbean parents. And it was really just going from there, got involved in the script. And in, in essence, the the... My episode called Red, White and Blue out of the five episode Small Axe series is around a father and son's um, relationship. Um, my father obviously wasn't happy. I would join the police, especially who was the victim of a brutal police beating while I was in the application process and how that plays itself out in the long run um, that my, my, my father and in the drama he actually supports me. And it's, uh, it stops about there uh, after the first few years of, of my uh, you know, career, my 30 year career in the Met. So really it's just talking about the issues of racism and uh, the institutional element of that and how really we, we just need to um, reflect on these issues, especially with Black Lives Matter and the issues of George Floyd and really make sure that we don't repeat the past. I mean, for anyone that's, that's not seen, seen it, it's really, really fantastic. And it's, um, and it's available on iPlayer, so uh, you can watch it, watch it actually, now. Actually, but, I should have said that A-lister John Boyega is playing me. So yeah. Yeah, that's another attraction. Um, <laughs> and, and that was beyond my wildest dream, not only meeting Steve McQueen and being part of it, but then to be told that John Boyega was going to play me and he did an amazing job. And I, I don't know if you know, but uh, he's been nominated for a Golden Globe for the small screen. Um, so we're really pleased about that. Well, I was going to ask you, what's it, what's it, how did it actually feel when you went? So did you have any, any say whatsoever in the casting? Not so much in the casting, but around the script yeah. and, and, and around the, the, the sets and making sure that the uniform and all of these sort of um, paraphernalia that police officers carry is authentic, the police car, et cetera. And, and they were quite fortunate that within the crew was a retired cop as well. So he really did an excellent job um, to advise Steve. And, and so many people 
um, either current officers or retired officers have said it's really authentic and how they recreated Hendon and all of the old star police stations. So it's really um, job well done. And what was it like working with Steve McQueen? Well, he's a very challenging person. He's, he's got this knack of really sort of lasering in if he's not clear on something. And, and, he, and he can get quite adversarial because he said to me, you say you love your father, but you still go ahead and join the police knowing that the officers you're joining will maybe the ones that beat him up. How can you say you, you, you love your father? It doesn't make sense. And uh, I remember he was attacking me like this in a restaurant <laughs> and people were looking around <laughs> thinking, what is going on with these guys here? But I, just basically, I basically told him it's my faith. My faith was the calling. It was the response that went beyond even my father's feelings. And, and that, terrible as it may seem, but, but I knew that my father, such a great guy, such a role model, he would come around, as it were, knowing that I was focused on joining the police to make changes from within. And unfortunately, he did. And um, on the first day, I went to Hendon. He actually drove me there. So, and that's one of the poignant scenes in the film. It is very much so. And I, um, I just, it was very moving. And, and it was also very moving in the conversation at the end of the end of the film. Just really, really powerful. And and John Boyega. So, what's it like then, having a an A list playing you? I mean, <laughs> well, in the reality, do you think he did a, a good job? No, he did a brilliant job. I, I must admit, he. Um, well, I don't like to say this, but it so happens I met John when he was an up-and-coming young actor um, because the film that made him starting his whole career was called Attack on the Block. And my son, my youngest son, actually applied for that role. So I used to see John Boyega at the castings and he could see very driven, very focused young man. And then another coincidence, some of you might know, I was involved in the Damalola Taylor investigation. Now, John and his sister were one of the last two people to see Damalola alive just before he left the, left the library and unfortunately um, was attacked by those uh, two young men. So because John and his sister actually went to school with Damalola. So there was that connection. And then also my wife is actually Damalola's father's cousin, right. Richard Taylor. So it's such a, a real connection. So when we finally met around this project uh, on, on the Small Axe episode, we just got on so well. So yeah, he, he's a um, really uh, phenomenal actor and you know he's going from strength to strength. And I, and I really believe uh, he should win the Golden Globe, you know keeping everything crossed and <laughs> prayers and everything. <laughs> and was your wife pleased with her casting? <laughs> yeah, I, I think everyone was pleased with each of the actors through the emotional truth. Yeah. I, I think they really kept that so authentic. There might be smart, slight things about, like John Toussaint, lovely guy who played my father. Now, he didn't, he didn't quite make a Jamaican accent because he's from... Barbados, which is not a problem because the emotional truth he brought into that mm. role was amazing. And it's similar to um, Gretel, uh, um, Antonia Thomas, who did Gretel, may not have exactly the right accent, but the way she brought that role alive and how she mixed with John and that, that certain point in scenes, again, just can't fault it. Mm. And what was it like when you when you saw the film for the first time? Did you, were you did, was there, did the family all go? And uh, what was it like for you? Yeah, we went to a private show, show. Sorry, went to a private showing of the film and in Soho, and it was one of these uh, film studios, and it was a big screen. So it was quite interesting seeing yourself on the big screen. <laughs> and uh, yes, I, I had um, fr friends and family there, and members of the crew uh, and the script. And yeah, it, it was phenomenal to, to, to see that. And I, I mean, it's the most surreal um, experience I've had for a very long time because all of a sudden your life is playing out on this screen by an A-lister actor with an amazing director who's done an amazing job on all of the, the episodes actually. So I, I must admit, I, I, 
it's beyond my wildest dream. I, I, I think it's just divine intervention, how the book and the film has coincided. Uh, I don't need to be a forensic scientist to know that God's DNA is in there somewhere. So I'm, I'm just very fortunate and very blessed. Thank you. And I mean, how accurate is it? Is it how, much, how much artistic license was taken or, or all those storylines absolutely on the button? Oh, there's always a bit of artistic license. And um, so, some, some of the um, um, scenes, like the warehouse scene, that's yep. a bit of a combination of a couple of um, incidents where I had to ask for backup and officers didn't quite respond as, as quick as they should. And um, I can safely say no one attacked me from behind and basically <laughs> gave me a kick in. I, I, I've been very fortunate over the years that if I could talk myself into a problem, I could talk myself out of it. So I'm really pleased that I'm, I was never subject to a really bad sort of beating. Well, I was um, impressed on the film by the speed at which you got up, chased him down and got him. So after being... Yeah, well, like and, and obviously flying through the air onto those cardboard boxes. Yes. I, I, I think that, again, that's a bit of John's uh, license for his Star Wars, because he was doing a lot of those Star Wars type things, you know. <laughs> the only thing is he didn't have one of those... Um, um, was it wands or whatever they call them in Star Wars? You know, yeah, those, yeah. Those, um, those weapons they use. So anyway, um, yeah, he, he had to do that. And there was a few more, few more sort of little co co conversations about, oh, you're joining the Force. What, well, you're going to be a Jedi? That sort of thing. Yes, I, yes. I... <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, and you're... And... Were you, were you were such a good? Are you such a good mover up to funk music? I was really I'm better than that. that. Yeah, <laughs> I'm better than that, Ed. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> in fact, when we went on the set um, in late 2019, I think about October, November time, um, I went with my um, best friend Lee John of Imagination, mm -hmm. and he's actually played by Tyrone in the film. So Lee and myself were giving him some combination nation for the both of them to try out so, <laughs> so we were teaching them uh, some of our moves from back in the 70s so there we go and the 80s, so it's really good <laughs> and you i mean you've already uh, alluded to this earlier on Libra, but basically i mean there are two very powerful uh, things going on in, in the film one is your personal uh, story and you've talked about your uh, already about your relationship with your father but there's also a family friend jesse stevens uh, that's and that relationship also comes out very powerfully in the film. And of course, the second uh, theme we've talked about is the world of policing, and, and particularly in the 1980s. Before we go into the policing issues, perhaps you can just tell us a bit about the um, about the, the personal uh, stuff. And in particular, um, you know, you've mentioned your dad, but what about Jessie Stevens? What role does she as she played in your life? Well, Jessie is actually Lee John's mother, and, and she made an amazing role. I mean. Till, till this day, and she's still alive. She's 93 years young. She defies logic, um, very active in the community still. She runs a community centre in Turnpike Lane in North London. Um, at, but no, she was always working with the police, community liaison, partnership work. And when I was in a real dilemma, especially when my father had been beaten up by the police and he was suing them, fortunately, successfully did that, she said, Leroy, I know you, you, you feel guilty, and, but you need to follow your dream. You need to follow your purpose. And she even said, you know, don't worry about other people because some people were quite hostile, even thinking about, you know, me even thinking about joining the police, much less joining. I, I actually said, if you ever want to reduce a Christmas card list by 99%, join the police. <laughs> you know, that's one way you cut a lot of friends down. But, but that's for anyone regardless of the background, but there's an added complication, an added um, sort of consequence, really, that people think, well, you're letting the side down as a black man joining uh, a racist organisation. That's how they see it. Mm. But Jesse put me at ease with that, say, listen, we need to have a reflective organisation. We need to, you know, you need to be in it to change it. You know, mm. you can't steer a ship from the shore. You've got to be on board in the captain's cabin to make those changes. And fortunately, that was such an encouragement. And throughout my career, she was a real encouragement. And even in retirement, she, she still is. So her presence in my life was just as important as anyone else when it came to my police career. 
And uh, yeah, I, I call her mum since my mother's passed away um, almost 20 years ago now. You know, I call her mum. So I'm, I'm very blessed with that, that relationship as well. Well, it, it does come out wonderfully in the film. And um, the, I mean, the film ends with that very poignant scene with you and, and you and your dad, and he becomes reconciled and understands why you've made your decision. And, but what then happens next? What's, happen, what after the, what's your career trajectory after that film? Well, in, in all honesty, um, I should really plug my book, really. <laughs> <laughs> sitting al alongside me there. Um, yeah, I I'd say that the film is great, but it's still only the starter. The main cause yeah. is that bad boy there. And, you know, I I'm really pleased that the book, the, the book actually takes you on that journey. And, and a lot of it is a spiritual journey. And, and, and I think there, there's a certain amount of that spiritual connection between John and, and um, Steve will play me and my father because they, they needed to be that. And that sort of sense of, you know, st stepping in faith and, and really understanding that, that if you keep sticking to what your, your vision is, you know, certain things will make, uh, you will make breakthroughs. And uh, that's what my career is all about. And, and, and I suppose, a lot of the ways I've gone through breakthroughs is to be in the eye of the storm. You know, mm. some people say, well, I'm not going to go in the eye of the storm. I'm not going to come out of my comfort zone. But, but sometimes your worst nightmare can be your biggest breakthrough. And that's the opening line of my book, really. Mm. That's really what the book is all about and the next steps after the film. And I'm looking for anyone who wants to make it into a series. Or, <laughs> or, or, and I'm not precious that it could be fiction if you want to. But no, I, I'm... I'm there's quite a few people have shown an interest, but, you know, um, that sort of TV world's quite difficult at the moment because of COVID and everything. But um, I, I'm, I'm, I know that there will be next steps. Because a lot of people have said, please do another edition or another episode or a series. So we're working on that. And sort of thinking about your, the other things that you've done in your in your career. I mean, you, you, you've been involved in the uh, inquiries over the death of Stephen Lawrence and Damilola Taylor. What do you think's come out of those inquiries? And um, do you think they really had impact? Oh, absolutely. Pre-McPherson, casual racism, the N-word, the W-word. I, I even had the N-word, um, you know, massive words, uppercase on my locker, mm. all these sort of things. That stopped or reduced significantly, I would say 95%. So you never had that sort of discourse in the canteen or you saw officers um, being overtly racist to members of the public, etc. That stopped. And then McPherson brought in so many different um, changes. It was a change agent for the organisation. It was like a royal commission in a lot of ways. Mm. And... Um, but the important thing is they had independent oversight to monitor the progress, all the performance indicators. So those 70 recommendations, majority were police, but including education and health, et cetera. But the uh, Home Secretary, Jack Straw at the time, he developed the Stephen Lawrence Steering Group, and that was the way in which he could monitor progress against all the force areas and other ministries. And it had Neville Lawrence and myself was even on that um, group as the first chair of the National Black Police Association. And that's what kept chief constables and the commissioner to account because what gets measured gets done. And it's quite clear that we saw that exponential progress in terms of more reflective organization from 2% black and minority ethnic to 12% in the first 10 years. Mm. Massive improvement. We saw family liaison officers being developed, um, independent advisors groups. Also, the Race Relations Amendment Act came out mm. of that and hate crime on the statute books. So there's some massive changes. Um, unfortunately, the first 10 years didn't get replicated by the, the following 10 years. That brings us up to uh, 2020 in terms of austerity as eroded. All of these sort of citizens focus work with safer neighbor teams and safer schools officers and unfortunately um even the brexit factor that is emboldened certain people that hate crime went through the roof mm -hmm. and unfortunately the police are a reflection of 
of the public. And so you start to see a bit more of that um, type of racist comments coming through, which we never used to see before. So, and you know, and, and my, my concern is, is not 10 steps forward and then 10 steps back, because I don't want to see the police in its current position, which reminds me of a pre-McPherson era. It's sad for me to say, but that's one of the things I have a real issue about. And, 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 and it's not around the race and equality issue, it's around the firefighting type policing. You know, we're not seeing the proactivity that you used to have before, especially with the black community. Well, something you, you sort of alluded to in that was about the nature of police and, and, and the wider population. And one of the things that I was, lines that really struck me in, in the film was that um, uh, you quote Sir Robert Peel, the founding father of modern British policing. Perhaps you could just remind us what the, the, the Peelian principle behind uh, policing in this country is. Well, I, to, be, to be honest, I, again, I say it in the book, it, I mean, Sir Robert Peel in 1829, when he set up the Met Police, or, you know, Bow Street Runners, as they were called, and Peelers. He said that the police are the public and the public are the police. There needs to be that contract. And especially the target group of people you need to work with, especially the ones you may not be engaged in. And at the moment, with knife crime being horrendous, and, and not just in London, but in different towns and cities, you need to engage with the young people. Uh, don't try and scare them because they're already scared with these postcode type um, divisions and the fact that some of it is gang related and involves drugs, etc. So the fear factor of, you know, the strong narrative is not having that effect. And to say we're going to st you're going to stop you because stop and search is not going to work without community trust and confidence, because stop and search is a blunt tool, but it's sharpened up by community intelligence. And the more they trust you, the more they will give you information, especially the target group. And that's why we set up um, in the Black Police Association, we set up the, uh, an initiative called Void Youth. Um, I've been the chair up until last year for the best part of 20 years since we got um, started. And we realize that education is the key. We've got to engage with the young people and, and let them understand, you know, their rights and responsibilities and buy into their communities, which I think is critical. Mm -hmm. At the moment, young people don't have that trust in police and they're not buying into their communities as they should. I think one of the issues that does come up with our police conference on a regular basis is the, the, the resourcing of policing uh, and, the, and the pressures on police and, and the the decline of community policing um, because of resource constraints. I mean, but from what, from what you say, you feel that, that that's a, a strategic uh, mistake, really. The, focusing on the community is, is, is key. Absolutely. That's why the peeling principles are just as important now. I mean, certain force areas actually made different decisions not to cut back on their citizen-focused assets, whether it's safer neighbor teams or, or, or any sort of multi-agency approach with local authorities. So they didn't see dramatic rises in knife crime and proliferation of gangs, especially in urban settings. So it's not just, it's, it's quite patchy, but the ones who kept those relationships with the public have not seen that breakdown and, and the barriers that we see in the Met. And so they're not just firefighting and responding from one incident to another. And they don't know really what's caused that feud. How is it going to blow, you know, get this place somewhere else? Because the young people know not to, to walk around with knives. They know where to stash them. They know once the police flood an area because of an incident, a stabbing or a shooting, they move on after a couple of days. So they, they, they work it out. And so... But you need the intelligence from the community to say, listen, we know where they're keeping their, their, their knives and their guns. That proactivity has to be essential. And that's part of the public health approach where you direct your assets with, with, in a holistic approach with other agencies. And so police actually will be more intelligence led as opposed to this firefighting type arrangement. I'm sure that we can... We'll pick up on, on that in, in, in the Q&A. 
Um, just one, one more uh, question before we move on to, to the questions that are coming in. Um, the social justice charity uh, Voyager that you've you founded, perhaps you could just tell us a bit about that. What's, what lies behind it all? Well, as far back as the uh, late 90s, early O's, we saw knife crime was start to rear its ugly head, as it were, and it being the weapon of choice. So we realized, again, education was the key. So working with the target group of young people who are prone or risk to be manipulated or brainwashed into using a knife or getting involved in negative peer groups or even gangs. So we realized that giving them um, a real immersion into policing, and we used to take them up to Hendon for a residential. Now we take them to outward bound um, adventure areas, but they have that connection with the police and they, and they realize what is a good stop, what's a bad stop, to know they can change their environment and work with statutory agencies. So it's not just senior officers, but also senior members of local authority, etc. And that helps them to know they can change their environment and not become a victim of it. And, and that was the, our first leadership program was 20 years ago in 2001. And I'm, I'm really pleased that we still deliver those programs. And we specialize especially, um, for young people who might a more vocational type of um, programs because the Young Leaders for Safer Cities we've been running for that amount of time is a BTEC level two. And the, you know, it's very demanding on young people. And we've now pitched it at year nine so that it doesn't dis disrupt their uh, GCSEs at year 10 and 11. So we're, we're really pleased that now our alumni is, is going over 20 years and our young people who started are now parents themselves mm. and they're teaching their own children the same sort of um, issues around stop and search and changing things for the better. And I'm really pleased some of them are saying, well, we can't wait to get them enrolled once they're old enough. And uh, that for me shows legacy. And, and that's why Voyager is one of the jewels in the crown uh, for my career. Well, that's wonderful. It's been going long enough now to be able to see the, the fruits of it really coming through. That's tr um, tremendous. Now, just moving on to some uh, question that's, um, that's come in uh, here from uh, Deborah Brown. Uh, and Deborah's asked, uh, what are your observations about the Metropolitan Police today? And would you encourage black, Asian and minority ethnic community uh, members to, to join in 2021? I would never discourage anyone from joining the police or any other vocation. I, I would encourage anyone to take on that role, especially policing. It has to be more reflective. As I said, we saw exponential growth during the first 10 years of Lawrence, but it seems to have leveled off and we're not seeing that first amount of, of development. So we need to have people who look like London to, a, you know, to be part of the organization because there's an inextricable link. The way in which you um, get the best out of your diverse personnel helps you to be better equipped to serve the needs of a diverse public. So that's really important. And there's no no-go area for activism and advocacy. Um, and I want to see people going into the organization not to assimilate and strip themselves of their beliefs and values and, acqui and acquiesce and, and, and just take on the, the strong testosterone driven culture. Uh, bring in your, your languages, your experiences, your culture and your intelligence and, and all of that. And, and that's what's going to make the Met Police more of a modern organization. And, and I really believe any force area who is doing that is more efficient and more effective because it builds trust. It actually builds connections and helps that proactivity of police. So they're not just reacting from one incident to another. And then from Marilyn Bailey is asked, uh, what are your hopes for the future of black police officers? Well, I want them to be able to achieve their true potential from not only staying longer, because you're four to five times more likely to leave the organization if you're black than your white counterparts, especially in the first two or three years. And you're also um, subject to um, discipline 
two to three times more likely to be disciplined if you're black than you're white. As you know, I was actually investigated for a trumped up charge um, in 2003, which fortunately I was able to push back. It didn't even go to court. I had a bit of trial by media, but I sued the organization successfully for the, the reputational damage, similar to my father many years earlier, um, like father, like son, I suppose. Um, but the important thing was we, we, we didn't just um, think, oh, we're just going to, um, you know, do anything. But we really need to, to understand that the organization, you know, let, let me just say this. The Met Police, there's nothing wrong with the Met Police or any other force area that, that can't be resolved by what is good with it. There is nothing wrong with the Met. It's all there. It really is. It just needs the ethical leadership and it really needs the accountability, the independent oversight, as I've already mentioned, and a real understanding of what they're there to do. They, you know, for me, we're peacemakers. We're, we're supposed to keep the peace. We're not supposed to be the hard-nosed copper who goes in, you know, and, and body slams people. I, I must admit, I never body slam anyone. Some people ran away from me and I had to catch them. The odd rugby tackle went in, but that's about it. I was not into this really, you know, trying to overpower people by the strength of, of your, your might. I, I, I like to use the strength of my relationship I'm, I'm having with people. I, I, that's the sort of thing I want to see coming back into policing, that light touch, that real understanding, and, and, and let it be, you know, something that we can all say we contribute because communities police themselves. It's, it's not just police, police, communities, police. So communities actually police themselves. And, you know, especially how we've seen, you know, it, it, in, to make stronger communities where, you know, it's not, you know, um, crime infested, but you start to see people who actually buy into the communities, especially young people. If I can only emphasize, we need our young people to buy into their communities and, and feel a sense of belonging. Thank you. And then we've got a question here from Thomas Probert who asked, uh, you characterize stop and search as a blunt instrument, but hinted that it could be used in a more intelligence led fashion taken together with your observation that what gets measured gets results, how important in your view is the collection of racial data about police street contact? Well, I, I think all that data is important. It's how you analyze that data. Because I, I think one of the, the issues um, I, I, I always hear is, well, it's because more black people on the streets. And so they're the ones that are gonna get stopped. To, to some extent, that could be right, because more white people, let's say in Glasgow, get stopped for, for, for stop and search. But my, my um, importance, my emphasis even in all of this is, are we actually getting to the main people? You know, especially in a negative peer group or a gang, they're the older ones. They're the ones that manipulate the younger ones to go out into the street, to start, um, doing the, all the initiations to be that sense of belonging and identity, which is one of the key issues. And they go into a robbery or, or they stab someone and, and all these sort of amazingly bad things. But we don't get to the older ones mm -hmm. because you can arrest them, but there'd be another 10 or 20 to take their place because that treadmill does not stop. So you need to get that real understanding of who to stop when and where, but that proactivity is the piece that's missing. And I think the, the, the other thing is through the decade, there is a real issue about how police officers perceive black men. And there's a link about them, they, they actually tend to be more aggressive because I think they fear them more. And so they real go in hard and they're going, so I've seen white groups having a, a different type of interaction with the officers, even though they might, could be quite boisterous, just as the black groups, but it's not that hands-on that you see with the black group. And so that's the sort of thing. Do not fear them, work with them. 
so they can tell you about the older ones that manipulating the youngsters that you might be stopping on a regular basis. And, and so unfortunately, one in 10 of those stops end up in something and the other nine out of 10 is causing resentment. Well, you know, if, if it was a private organization, you'd be bankrupt in no time. Let's work smarter, not just harder. I know cops put their, li their lives on the line every day and I respect them and I, I, you know, I love being part of the Met and even part of the, 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 the retired Met family. But we need to be clear that if you do the same old things and, do the, and, and expect different results, it's insanity. And, and we can't carry on like this. We've got to change. We've got to be understanding on, on how we approach it. And let me just end with this. You, you know, one of the things that's criminalized um, a lot of black youngsters is these, out, um, you know, um, crime by algorithm, assessing people's criminality through the matrix or, um, well, other four series give it different names. And we, it's just been found so many times by the information commissioners and even, even the UN have said it is institutionally racist. In fact, in fact, I call it institutional racism by algorithm. So we really need to even say, listen, if these things don't work and Sadiq Khan finally, after four and a half years, has finally reduced the number of people on the matrix because they see it as a bit of kudos. You know, young people think, oh, I'm an amber. Oh, I'm, I'm a red. They think, wow, it's, it's their stripes. And, and in fact, the gangs start to use the same point system as the Matrix to get their youngsters to do even more this devastatingly bad things. So we've got to be clear on the impact of our tactics, but we've got to work with the target group even more so instead of trying to create fear with them and barriers. Uh, Khadija Manasseh has uh, asked this question, said, taking into a co uh, consideration the recent acknowledgement by the Met regarding the 22,000 searches on young black men during lockdown, how can uh, the justification be made that the Met is changing? Well, it can't be justified. As far as I'm concerned, my senior officers who are on TV or whether it's the commissioner or anyone else, that they just strike me as being in denial because they're saying in my service of 30 odd years, we have seen stop and search work. There is no correlation in any analysis, even a home office analysis unit shows there's no correlation between stop and search and knife crime or any other weapons because they say, oh, if you don't do stops, knife crime goes up. There is no connection like that. And I, I, I just, don't, I, it really, really annoys me. And I get so angry when they just are going to force this through. And, and even the Deputy Commissioner, Steve House, came out last week saying, well, it doesn't matter the, the, the fallout. We're going to do it anyway because we know we're saving lives. You are not saving lives. And there is no analysis to prove that because that target group who you need to be working with are not going to tell you where the next stabbing is going to be or who did that stabbing or that shooting. I mean, it, it, it's just so blatantly obvious that the narrative is making things worse. It's, no, it's like the war on drugs. You know, has it worked over the last 30 years? No. So why would we do exactly the same thing? And it's costing lives. So I, I, I'm a great believer of let's look at this thing in the cold light of day without the assumptions, without the stereotypes, strip away, do that analysis to really look at if it can have inbuilt assumptions. And I'll close by saying this. If a lot of the analysis is based on the criminal intelligence system in each force era, you need to really look at how information is gathered and brought into the intelligence system because it has a lot of assumptions. You know, they, they do the four by four analysis, but that's at level two or even level three. But level one does not necessarily get that sort of rigor. And, and, and there's certain um, information that goes into the criminal intelligence that really shouldn't be there. And that's why Sadiq Khan is saying, no, 
were taking out a hundred, a thousand youngsters off the matrix. Well, as I said, he should have done that four years ago. And we've got to be doing some very significant things like that. Thank you. Now, we have a question here from a police and crime commissioner from uh, Alan Michael. And Alan says, uh, as the police minister with Jack Straw, when we set up the McPherson inquiry, I was in the room at the stage in the hearings when the scales fell for a number of Met chief officers who realized that they had been defending the indefensible. Change happens when we see things we hadn't been able to see before. You spelt out the principles of policing brilliantly, but what are we not seeing today? And what do you see as our next challenges? Well, I just want to say, um, Alan, I remember you. Um, and I remember um, not only McPherson, but also your Home Affairs Select Committee on Young Black People and the Criminal Justice System. And that was in 2007, I believe. And um, that sort of work, I think, was so, so amazing because he was looking at the target group and how you work with them. But just going back to the question, what we're not seeing today is the independent oversight piece because in 29, 2010, ACPO, as it was then, Association of Chief Police Officers, now the MPCC, was given the authority to mark their own homework. So in a success-driven organisation, I don't know any chief constable is going to mark, um, him or her is going to mark their organisation down. And so there's no actual peer review. I mean, HMIC is supposed to do that, but... They, they really haven't got the teeth to say, hold on, this is not being looked at in a way that it should, and you will be reprimanded. Because that's the sort of strong leadership that Jack Straw was doing. You need to shape up or someone else will do it. You know, that sort of thing. And, and, and I think that's what I want to see happening. There needs to be that assessment of progress and the results. And more importantly, what is the impact? Is it building trust and confidence? Is it starting to see more intelligence getting into the organization so you're a lot more proactive? Is it actually um, you get a more reflective organization? And so you, you are getting better clear-ups for stabbings and shootings. Because at the moment, the, the amount of clear-ups for these things is practically half what it was 10, 15 years ago. We used to pride ourselves in the Met that our clear-ups for murders was 80 to 90%. It's almost half that now because no one's talking to you. And then, to be quite honest, if you don't make people feel safe, they're not going to write a statement. They're not going to go on an ID parade. They're not going to give evidence of court because if you can't make them feel safe, why would they put themselves on offer? So that's the thing. Go back to basics, making the reassuring people, not only reassuring to patrol when they're stabbing and shooting, but build those relationships on a sustainable way. And I, that's what I want to see coming back, that citizens focus approach built into the public health model, which we know works. We've seen it working in Thames Valley, in Glasgow, in West Midlands. And, and it needs to be policy driven, not just personality, because we've seen too many chiefs move on and it's lost or senior leaders, they move and that policy is gone. We need, it needs to be strong policy driven and it has to be monitored by independent oversight. Thank you. Now, Sylvia Zanin has asked, what do you think about, call, about the calls to defund the police? No, I don't like that term, defunding. I, I've been on record to say it's unhelpful. But when you look at what they're suggesting over in the States, and I know defunding police came from Black Lives Matter in response to George Floyd, etc. But when you strip, into, strip away all the rhetoric and you look at what's going, what they're actually advocating, they're talking about directing police assets to areas where they've got the expertise. So you don't get police going to mental health cases because a lot of ways, just by, it's not necessarily what the officers do, but just by turning up with the blue flashing light and the siren and you're in uniform, it triggers people, especially if they're vulnerable with mental ill health or 
drug-induced psychosis. Or, and, and if they're in some form of, um, you know, cause for concern, whether they're acting strangely or, or any form of, you know, concern that they can hurt people, then calling police is not necessarily the first thing to do. And, and then obviously we know when they're in a hyperactive state, restraining them with handcuffs and leg restraints and, and even sometimes these pit hoods and, and all these things, people die because of the hyper, hyperactive state they're in. So my point is, with the defunding issue, the term, I don't like, but the, the fact that they're asking for assets to go to be used in a more bespoke, data-driven way. So officers, if they're not going to the drugs or to the mental health cases, they can be directed more to dealing with the criminals who are dealing, the drug dealing, mm. with, with, with the various forms of um, crimes that are making our communities in fear. Uh, people are in fear. So th that's what the public health approach is, that the public health approach is actually equivalent to defunding. Now, I don't to mix messages because the public health approach is, is actually saying it's asset driven and you deploy your assets according to the expertise. So you can have a triage approach when it comes to mental health cases or uh, drug related cases. You don't necessarily have to have police officers responding to these things because sometimes they make things worse because they're not equipped to assess people properly. And, and, and in all honesty, they could be being deployed to something that really aligns to what they are there to do. So for me, the public health approach is the way forward and it's not far removed from a lot of the defunding arguments. Thank you. Now to go in a rather different tack, and uh, is there any, this is from Josephine McNulty, who's asked, is there anything you miss about policing now? Well, I, I suppose once you've got public service in your um, DNA, so to speak, you never lose it. Um, I, I suppose I'm still doing the activist activism and advocacy role of policing. But, you know, sometimes you see th certain things you'd like to step in, um, especially if someone's vulnerable. And, you know, I've had to sometimes speak to people. Um, and fortunately, I, I haven't had a hostile reaction but you've got to be very careful because, um, again, you know, you've got to be showing wisdom. Even if you're a sworn officer in uniform and you've got backup, you know, I'm not it's into just um, intervening and, and making things worse. So you have to go in, in, in an appropriate, reasonable and proportionate way. And uh, I, I suppose then you're dealing with people and you're solving problems and you're building links with the community that's the sort of things that really i miss being able to you know crack that lever and get a strategy where everyone buys into and we we, we see safer streets and we have people really seeing that police are for them and not against them that 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 that's the thing i i, I just love cycling around i i love patrolling i just love talking to people and, and, and letting them see things in a totally different way. Um, I still do that now, but I must admit, there is a certain amount of kudos when you're um, an officer and, and whether it's on the streets or, or, or even when I was working on the Olympics, that was my last operational role. For me, it, it was great just to see, you know, the 2012 games being such a success and, and really joyful um, experience for everyone. And, and that's the sort of thing I miss, you know, seeing um, the Met at its best. And I mean, obviously, you as a police officer, you retire early. Is the, is the police good at, at helping you at that stage in your life? Because you've got so much still to give. And uh, what's the process at the end? Well, it's not very good <laughs> because I can... <clears throat> I can safely say, I don't know many, especially at a senior level, you don't get sat down and have a debrief and people sort of want to really, um, it's not commonplace to do that. In fact, um, my, my sort of debrief in, in 
even the Met was in the Guardian newspaper. So a journalist said, have you been, um, you know, have you had your exit interview? And I said, no. He said, let's do it in the Guardian then. I said, so I said all right. But no, obviously there was no uh, official secrets, anything like that. But um, they're, they're not very good at doing exit interviews. Um, but if you've got a very strategic role and, and you're going to leave a massive gap, then obviously they'll, they'll make sure. But it, 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 it's, it's mainly the staff associations, whether it's the federation or the superintendents or NPCC, whatever. They're, 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 they normally are a lot more bespoke how they get, you know, make sure that officers are, are ready for that transition. And, and going back to the question, I, um, I, I, I actually really was looking forward to retirement. I, I thought, I've done my 30 years. I want to do something different. And, um, you know, I, I just wanted to be my own boss. <laughs> I, mean, I was always getting someone breathing down the back of my neck, you know. Um, sometimes it was an investigating officer trying to, well, you know, <laughs> trying to say I did something wrong. Or I'd get a senior officer saying, well, why are you saying that anyway? I said, well, it's the truth. You know, so, yeah, I, I must admit, I, I feel there's a burden removed in some respects, being able to speak truth to power without feeling, well, actually, I'm making it difficult for my colleagues. And, you know, I'm not doing it for my, difficult for myself and my family, all these sort of things. So um, I, I just like the fact that I can devote a certain amount of time around the things I'm really passionate about and I'm able to really, you know, um, dictate my own vision and uh, so far so good <laughs> going back to the uh, the film uh, Deirdre Osborne has asked this says, what was your interaction with the screenwriter Courtier Newland in making the script had you read his novels beforehand yes I, I uh, knew of Courtier um, I didn't read all of all of his novels but I knew you know, well, I've got to do my due diligence to make sure the person who's doing the script really knew it um, um, in a way that I knew, well, I knew Courtier could do a great job. And then I found out that Courtier lives just down the road from me, actually, right. in East London. So he, and, and I was really pleased that he would, he would call me quite regularly. At one stage, I was speaking more to Courtier than my wife, you know, <laughs> because, uh, you know, he would say, oh, I want to make sure I get this right. And... You know, so, no, I must admit, most of 2018, writing this, um, Courtier and Steve writing the script, Courtier was my main point of contact. So, yeah, and, and I must admit, Courtier did an amazing job uh, with Steve. So, again, it, it, it's um, quite interesting that all the people involved in the film, uh, John Boyega, Steve McQueen, Courtier, myself, a, a lot of what the film was actually saying about the father and son relationship is very similar to what they, what we all had to go through in our own lives during that same period, mm. uh, maybe a bit younger for John, but it's that same sort of period of that, you know, black father and black son and, and humanizing it. So it, 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 again, it was, um, it just seemed to chime all at the, all at the same time. And it was uh, just uh, such an amazing experience. We're running out of time, but time for two, two final questions. Um, this is from an anonymous attendee. What is your best advice for someone in a minority group who is trying to change the status quo, either at work, in education, or in the community? Well, if it's in the community, work very closely with the community. And Because and, and I, I said when I was joining the police, I'm a black man who happens to be a cop. And now in retirement, I'm still a black man and, and working with the community um, in that active activism and advocacy. It, it's, in terms of organisations, you need to have your internal staff support association. And, and, and don't apologise that because you're with people with that shared and common experience means, oh, you're into some conspiracy to, you know, erode the organisation. So build your, your own staff associations, even externally, get a mentor, get like minded individuals. You know, you've got to talk these things through because it took us two years before we went public with the Black Police Association in 1994 because we needed to get that clear in our own minds in that critical mass as founder members. So that's the way you do it. Thank you. The final question is, what's on the horizon for you now? 
presumably lots of book uh, <laughs> events and Zoom meetings. <laughs> yeah, well, um, what, really important, keeping in touch with grassroots organisations, and I will even include Cumberland Lodge. I, I think Brilliant. you're doing some really excellent stuff. So, you know, keeping involved in, in a lot of these sort of issues. Um, I, I'm actually um, sort of working on various um, directions of the book, maybe a children's version of it. In fact, on, on BBC um, website, the BBC Teach, um, they have actually done um, a Key Stage 3 and 4 version of each of the episodes. So mm -hmm. there's one of me uh, in red, white and blue. So again, going back into schools, um, I really think it's really important. As I said, um, that if there's anyone who wants to take on the script from the book, hey, you know, I'm, I'm the person. <laughs> um, and, and I suppose also, I, I just want to make sure that, um, you know, I don't take anything for granted. You know, I've got to work uh, with people um, that <clears throat> I believe we can make some changes. So you never know. With health and strength, I might go for high office um, in 2004, beyond. Um, I, I'm always conscious of not going into um, arenas where I don't think I'm equipped and I'm not going to have the rights sort of impact. So I, I'm still assessing, but it, it, if um, things develop over the next couple of years and I've got that sort of um, real, in, in my immediate sphere saying, yep, let's do this, then maybe it's something I can do. And well, uh, we'll see what goes on. Watch this space. Watch this space. Leroy, thank you very much. We need to draw to a close now. Um, if you, before we do so, just a few announcements. The first one is those who are joining us this evening if you haven't seen red white or blue uh, and blue it is available on bbc iplayer and you really won't want to miss it after this conversation uh, but also um you you may want to read the book that's over leroy's right shoulder so just to, just remind us a bit about the book yeah closing ranks my life as a cop it talks about my life and really it's it's around resilience um resourcefulness and impact how you make an internal impact and external. And if I can do it, anyone can do it. Great, thanks. And Cumberland Lodge, we're also currently running a series of webinars in the build-up to this year's police conference. Um, if you want to find out more about this, do have a look at our website. It's really fascinating work we're doing this year um, uh, online, which does mean we can bring more people in, despite the disadvantages of not being able to meet in person. So do have a look at what we're up to. Thank you, everyone, for being with us. And thank you, especially Leroy, for being such a wonderful conversation partner this evening. And all the best for the future. I look forward to seeing you in person before too long. And for those of us who are old enough to remember Dixon of Dot Green, the final thing to say this evening is good night, all. Good night. <laughs> good night.